for starting. Uh, I'm Kent Miller. My program is Space Science. Um, I'd like to start out by uh, defining what space, what I mean by space science. I've learned that when I say space science, quite quite often people think satellites and sensors, and that's not what I do. This is the science of space, the science of the space environment, the science that enables us to forecast space weather. Um, there are many aspects of space science. It, it covers a big territory, all of what we call geospace. And um, as you can see here, the, these are some of the topics that are covered by it. Uh, go all the way from the hot plasma of the sun to the, uh, through the solar wind to processes on the earth, the, even to the uh, neutral, oops, what do I do? Neutral atmospheric dynamics and, and gravity waves in, in the earth's atmosphere. Um, there are also several fundamental problems that can be addressed in space science, and this is something especially the plasma physicists like, because it's a plasma laboratory without walls. You can study plasma instabilities, uh, fluid flow, um, questions such as are listed here, uh, without the, uh, the laboratory apparatus intervening and, and uh, causing uh, changes in, in the results. So. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about how uh, we'll structure this talk. Traditionally, a space science talk will be divided up into the different uh, areas of geospace, the uh, sun, the solar wind, the magnetosphere, the thermosphere, the ionosphere. Uh, the problem is that each of these regions is affected by all the other regions. The, the sun uh, energizes and launches the solar wind, the solar wind uh, affects the magnetosphere, it, it causes currents to flow, and, and, and uh, the magnetic fields in the solar wind merge with the magnetic fields in the magnetosphere. The ionosphere is affected by the currents that flow in the magnetosphere, uh, and, that are, and particles are exchanged between the two. So you can't really look at any one of them in isolation. In fact, it goes the other way. This, uh, the uh, plot on the bottom here shows how the sun heats the troposphere, generates convection in the troposphere, generating tides and gravity waves that propagate upward and uh, affect the ionosphere and thermosphere. In fact, this plot here on the right is uh, a plot of total electron content on, the, on a global grid. The uh, uh, magnetic equator is, is pretty well followed by this, the high density, but you see these longitudinal structures in the uh, total electron content around the equator, and that's entirely the, the result of energy propagating up from the low atmosphere. So you can't neglect any one of these regions. You can't study any one in isolation from any other. And so uh, for my talk today, I wanted to talk about five areas that, that affect the Air Force mission. But, in, but show how each of these, these uh, areas of geospace, the sun, the solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, and the neutral atmosphere, how uh, in order to solve the problems that we need to solve for the Air Force, you have to understand uh, the effects from each of these areas. Um, so we'll start out with orbit prediction and, and uh, satellite reentry forecasting. The, um, um, satellite drag, which you need to know in order to forecast where the satellite, uh, to predict the satellite's orbit, is of course a function of atmospheric density, which is the result of the temperature of the atmosphere. The atmosphere heats up, uh, it expands, drag increases, satellites slow down. And, and I guess I need to apologize in advance to the space scientists in the audience. This is going to be a very much an oversimplification of what actually happens. But if, if you look at, uh, you know, most of the heating in the atmosphere is caused by photoionization. It's the result of uh, solar extreme ultraviolet radiation that can be pretty well predicted by looking at the sunspot cycle, the overall activity of the solar disk. But uh, a, a high percentage of the temperature is, is the result of joule heating. Joule heating is a result of strong electric fields dragging ions across the 
through the neutral atmosphere and it's frictional heating of the neutral atmosphere. Well, it's caused by these mag electromagnetic fields that we get from solar, the solar wind magnetosphere coupling caused by electricity and magnetism, electric and, mag electric and magnetic fields at the surface of the sun that can be predicted only if you can predict solar activity, which is a lot harder to predict than the, than the overall sunspot uh, cycle of the sun. And uh, then again, there's this other leg that I'd like to also include. We found out, we had a, 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 a MURI, that, a, an AFOSR MURI at the University of Colorado during the last solar minimum when the sun was really quiet. There, the, the input from the, the solar input was really the, the smallest that we've ever seen it in since the space age started. And he realized that uh, the energy coming up from below is a significant part of the heating of the thermosphere. This, the solar heating that leads to dynamics and, and through thunderstorms and topog topography, to gra atmospheric gravity waves that propagate upward, <coughs> break in the thermosphere and deposit their energy and heat the thermosphere. And so again, it's a coupled system, highly driven by the sun, but dependent on, on a lot of different uh, factors. Um, operationally forecasting the satellite uh, orbits is, is a difficult proposition. It's, uh, the Air Force Space Command would like a 72-hour prediction. Um, currently that's done by using a climatological model and calibration satellites, which does a good job most of the time, but it can't predict solar activity. And in fact, this, this plot on the right, whoop, uh, this plot on the right here that shows uh, with the yellow line, it's uh, an index of, that shows a magnetic storm occurred here. And the, uh, the, the blue histogram is the number of satellites that were lost from the, from the uh, catalog and had to be reacquired. The orbit, orbits redetermined and then put back in the satellite after this event. This is in 1989. Well, we've learned quite a bit since 1989, and it hasn't happened like that since then. But you can see still there's a problem whenever there's, there's uh, activity on the sun. So how do you forecast satellite drag? Well, at first you have to forecast the sun, which, uh, like I said, is not, is not uh, easy. Uh, in order to forecast what the solar activity, you have to know what the, the fine structure on the sun is doing. In fact, going back to this, you have to be able to look into these active regions on the sun and see the fine scale magnetic fields and see what these fields are doing, understand on a fine scale what's happening, uh, to, that leads to uh, eruptions, for example, solar flares and, and coronal mass ejections. Well, there, uh, there's a telescope being built by the National Science Foundation in Haleakala next to the uh, Air Force telescopes. It'll be a four meter solar telescope. Uh, and a smaller version of this telescope is at the Big Bear Observatory in California. Uh, this is a 1.6 meter off axis solar telescope. You, those of you that that used to torment ants with a little, <laughs> with a little hand magnifying glass. Think yeah, about a, a four meter or 1.6 meter tel uh, solar telescope looking at the sun. But the the advantage of the big uh, the big mirror is shown in this slide. The, this compares data of a small region of the sun. Of the sun. Uh, at the same time from the Hinoda satellite and from the Big Bear Observatory. The one on the, the, the figure on the, on the right here is the, from the Hinoda satellite. It's the largest solar telescope in orbit. It's a half meter telescope. And uh, so it's in orbit so you don't have the problem of the atmosphere uh, making it blurry. This is entirely the function of the resolution of a half meter telescope. And this on the right is the Big Bear Telescope with adaptive optics at the same time. So it shows you the, the advantage of the, of the aperture. And you're able to, we, we've seen the, these, uh, uh, anyway, it's the, these regions in between, the bright regions here show the fine structure of the magnetic field. And, so, and this is what we need to understand in order to, uh, to be able to predict. What scale what scale? Oh, flares, okay. Scale the, uh, one of these is maybe the size of the United States. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> All right. No, I just I've seen the United States superimposed on a plot like this, and it's about on the order of the same size. Okay. 
Uh, you have to understand the dynamics of the sun. This is, this is from data from this last year showing that at a time of a flare, a tsunami type event that's launched across the face of the sun when the flare goes off. Well, you have to understand the dynamics also. And you have to understand the, the, the uh, large scale magnetic fields. And then you, you have a really complex problem. This is a magnetic field modeled by John Linker, one of the PIs in the program, showing the uh, um, the magnetic fields on the sun and then, and then these uh, uh, dark shaded in regions here are regions of open field lines where the s solar energetic particles have access to the solar wind and, and can come as far as the earth and cause problems with their own uh, electronics in orbit. Um, and so even, even the uh, simplest structure is complex. You, we've all seen images like this from NASA satellites of, of solar prominences of coronal mass ejections. <laughs> These are flux tubes that are filled with plasma. They're a stable structure, uh, uh, it's ca what's called a flux tube, so it's a spiral uh, structure of magnetic field, but it's the pressurization of the, of the field by the plasma launches these things into space and uh, launches them toward the Earth sometimes. Uh, if they come toward the Earth, then, then again they can disturb the magnetic field on the Earth and cause problems here. Uh, this is uh, data by, uh, or an experiment by uh, Paul Bellin at, at uh, Caltech, where he's simulating these uh, magnetic arcs in a satellite experiment, uh, in a laboratory experiment. The, uh, you can see here where the, the, the arc is launched and, and uh, expands into space in, this, in a similar way to the coronal mass ejections on the sun. Uh, he's able to, to uh, examine the dynamics within the, within the structure by feeding um, hydrogen into the one leg of the, of the uh, arc and the nitrogen into the other. The, the hydrogen is the red and the nitrogen is the green and uh, watching how they propagate from the different feet of the, of the field line. Um, and so this is what a flare looks like close up you, from the Big Bear Observatory. You see the, uh, um, it's not just as, as simple as, as, as an explosion. It's a very complex structure. The dark lines that you see above the flare are um, magnetic field lines, cooler plasma on the magnetic field lines. If you saw them from the side, they'd be the arc like we saw in, in the last figure. And so it's a very complex process. We're just starting to understand, understand it. There are a few models that, that are starting to be able to predict uh, if you have an active region, if you can expect it to flare, or if you can expect it to launch a coronal mass ejection. And uh, this is one of these models. It's the ADAPT model that's being generated by, or that's by, the, um, by Nick RJ and his star team at, uh, at uh, FRL RV in New Mexico. And it, it uses um, data from uh, solar observations and then a, a magnetic field model to, uh, to generate the field uh, on the, the entire surface of the sun. Well, of course, we can only see the, the front side and we can't really see the poles. And that, that's all important to the, to the modelers. You see the, the, the white and the black here. The, that's different polarity of magnetic fields coming from the poles of the sun. The problem is we can only see the front side. Well, the, the ADAPT model now is um, including uh, results from what's called helioseismology in, in a way similar to the they do on the earth where you, if you have an earthquake you can look at the, the uh, waves coming through the earth and tell where the disturbance uh, of the earthquake occurred in the same way they look at waves on the sun and uh, map the disturbances on the night side <laughs> on the far side, the far side of the sun, as it goes around the, the back side. The sun rotates in 27 days, and so if you can't predict when a, an active region is going to come around from the back side, you can't predict what's happening. And so this is, this is now the, the new ADAPT model. You can see without the, uh, the far side of the sun, this active 
region. This, this is uh, solar flux units and of uh, an index called F10.7. It's a 10.7 centimeter flux from the sun. It's a proxy that they use for the uh, extreme ultraviolet from the sun. And it's not predicted, and, but then using this helioseismology, then here, including in the ADAPT, ADAPT model, they see that they, they can predict this um, uh, solar activity before it comes around to the, day, to the near side of the sun. Um, okay, so then the, uh, it, not enough to understand the surface of the sun, you need to understand how these things propagate to the earth. The, uh, the blue um, plot here in the upper right is called a halo uh, coronal mass ejection. If, it, if uh, CME is launched toward the earth, instead of seeing the, the arc prominence like we saw before, you see a halo as it comes toward the Earth. And uh, models can predict pretty well the velocity and the density of these coronal mass ejections. And one of the reasons is this recent work by uh, Dr. Bernie Jackson at UC San Diego, where he looks at scintillation from the stars as it comes through the interplanetary medium to the Earth, and by the, looking at the scintillation, can look at the boundaries of these coronal mass ejections as they come toward the Earth. And so this is his model of this coronal mass ejection, and uh, using what's called the Enlil uh, solar wind model, uh, can predict, and, and this is his fit to the, uh, the, the red is the measurement at the Earth of the uh, velocity and the density of the uh, coronal mass ejection. Uh, so progress is being made to, to and, and they're doing a good job, like I say, in the density and the velocity. The, uh, the, qu the outstanding question is the magnetic field within the uh, coronal mass ejection. And we have a, a, a BRI that is just starting that we hope to address that question to be able to forecast the magnetic field within the coronal mass ejection. So it hits the Earth and this is what happens. Well, this is a cartoon that is put together by Joe Grabowski at NASA, at NASA, but it shows a lot of the processes that occur when this energy gets to the Earth. The Earth is, is protected from a lot of what happens on the sun by the, by the dipolar magnetic field of the Earth. But, and because it's a dipole, the, the energy, the magnetic fields and the energy, energetic particles from the sun are, are deflected and funneled into the, into the uh, polar regions. And so you get this familiar auroral oval around the pole where most of the energy is deposited, but uh, you also get uh, high or uh, strong electric fields across the pole that uh, pull energy across the pole. Uh, dynamics are affected even as far as, as the equatorial um, ionosphere by uh, uh, magnetic storms that, that occur based on or because of the uh, interaction of the solar wind with the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, as plasma streams into the poles, it quite often bifurcates. This is data from uh, um, Todd Pedersen at RV showing uh, striations of plasma as it's coming across the poles, being pulled across by these strong electric fields. And uh, scintillations occur on the edges of these striations that <coughs> cause problems with, with communications and navigation over the pole. But also as it's pulled across the pole, it heats the atmosphere and affects, again, satellite drag, which is uh, what we're talking about now. And it, and it isn't always at the time you expect it. The magnetic field <coughs> in the solar wind, if it's pointed southward, you get uh, um, coupling between the magnetic field of the solar wind and the magnetic field of the Earth. And then you expect so, uh, magnetic disturbances to occur on the Earth. You expect currents to flow and uh, the problems that go with it. But this is a case that if this bottom panel is, is magnetic field, and this is uh, this, I don't know if you can see the light, light blue is the direction of the northward magnetic field. Well, it's all northward during this time, but yet you still see these strong 
uh, times of pointing flux into the poles and corresponding to uh, times, and this, this is uh, atmo neutral atmospheric density uh, calculated from satellite drag. So you get times of, of increased density even at times when you have a, a northward magnetic field, you don't expect a storm. Well, it turns out that what's happening at this time is that the field is coupling behind the Earth on the night, on the night side of the Earth and coupling into the magnetic field there and ca causing, uh, um, causing energy to come in from the, from the back side of, of the polar regions to the front side. Um, and to show that how the regions really are coupled, um, this is uh, data of where um, Dolores Kniff at the University of Colorado is looking at, at some magnetic storms, and uh, this DST index is an, in, is an indication to expect a, a geomagnetic storm. And when the index drops, you expect a, a strong storm. Well, in most cases, it drops, and you, and you get a uh, heating of the atmosphere. Uh, in some cases, you don't. And so she looked at the cases where you expect a storm, there is no storm that happens. It turns out that she found there's a precursor to the uh, storm that would uh, precondition the, uh, the magnetosphere, cause uh, our, our oral precipitation, increase the nitric oxide in the lower atmosphere. The in the uh, satellite drag that you would expect uh, on a normal storm. And so again, it shows the coupling of these di different processes in the atmosphere the, that uh, you can't really ignore one or the other. Normally, the, um, um, the electric fields from, from the magnetosphere cause strong um, dayward flow in, of the electrons in the uh, auroral region and, and, a, and a weaker flow over the poles. Um, again, not always the case. The, um, this is data, and I, and I really should have explained it the first. All of these cases that I'm showing are from people that are in my program. Things, uh, new results, a lot of them data from this past year. So uh, I'm using them as examples to show this interrelationship of the, of the regions, but it's really new data that I'm showing. And this is, uh, again, if you see along here, the satellite track, these are ion velocities. But now you see the strong ion velocities nightward over the poles, and not what you'd expect. Uh, it turns out that they've found that quite often you get this nightward flow over the poles and with the accompanying uh, joule heating, that's the purple um, trace here is, is the heating uh, of the ionosphere and the, of the atmosphere. Um, you get it over the poles where you've got open field lines. You don't, you don't expect the strong uh, uh, acceleration of the electrons that you get in the auroral zones, but, you f but they find that quite often the polar cap is the region where you get most of the heating of the ionosphere. Um, and one other slide before I leave satellite drag. Again, like I said, you can't ignore the, the low atmosphere. The, the plot on the, on the right is a, a plot, a theoretical plot of density perturbations that result from, from gravity waves and tides. It's mainly from tides. And so you see uh, this is altitude versus longitude. Uh, these density variations due to the, due to the tidal structure. And on this side is a calculation of the reentry of a satellite. And in this case, it's altitude versus latitude. So it's a polar satellite, and they've, they've calculated where it would re-enter depending on the longitude of the re-entry. And because of these, this structure in the, in the uh, density of the uh, atmosphere, you find that, that depending on wh where it, the satellite re-enters, it could either come in over, the, over Antarctica or it could come in over Mexico. <laughs> you know, so in order to, to calculate where this, or to, to know in advance where to expect the, the satellite to come in, you've got to understand the low, the tidal structure also. Uh, so you can't say, okay, I, I can predict orbit by predicting the uh, sun. You have to know the whole, the whole region, the temperature 
uh, rise can come from many places and so on and eventually we need a physics-based model that's good enough to, uh, to predict the, uh, the atmosphere to, the, to this required about 5% accuracy that we need. Uh, and so it's kind of a long way around to the, the slide on how I select my grants. Uh, mainly, it's, you look for the best ideas. There are always more good ideas and you have money to fund them, but uh, the, uh, there are also other agencies like NSF and NASA that have a lot deeper pockets than I do. And so, so I'm looking mainly for forecast, forecasting um, projects that lead to our ability to forecast in areas that are important to the Air Force. And um, so, well, quickly moving on to the next to the next category, satellite survivability. Uh, it's long been a problem how to uh, how to ensure that your satellite, once it's in space, will survive. The electronics is is then in, is uh, um, being affected by the high energy particles in the radiation belts. We found out in the 60s when the U.S. Uh, tested a nuclear device in space and Operation Starfish that you rapidly lost almost all of the satellites that were then in orbit. Oopsie. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but again, it can come from many different areas. You know, you, you get uh, proton, uh, high energy protons from coronal mass ejections. You get uh, uh, magnetospheric compression and uh, the uh, um, resulting electric fields from uh, the the uh, solar wind, you get the the magnetosphere will will uh, cause charging of the spacecraft, and and even you have to worry about galactic cosmic rays. Um, this is just a, a real quickly a, a a cartoon of the radiation belts to show kind of the problem in 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 this. You, you see that, uh, well, at low Earth orbit, most satellites are beneath or lower than the radiation belts. And at geo, you're right at the very top, where you're not really in the in the energetic part of the belts. But there's a lot of a lot of, there are a lot of assets that orbit inside the belts, and and probably the best known is GPS. It orbits in, inside the radiation belts, so it's important to know what not only what uh, radiation is there, but what you can expect in the future. Again, this forecast problem. <clears throat> Are you going to get energized from a solar um, event? Or, you, or how fast will uh, the uh, energetic particles uh, decay from the radiation belts? How fast can they be lost? Is there any way you can accelerate that loss? And in fact, that's an area that's the, of active research now. I'm looking into wave-particle interaction can you um, can you broadcast an electromagnetic wave into the radiation belts that will cause precipitation of the particles from the belts? Uh, and this quickly is a, a particle precipitation event at the top. This is a spectrum of, of um, energy versus L shell. L shell is a measure of of the altitude of the magnetic field line. Uh, as it crosses the equator, so higher L shell means higher altitude, essentially. But it, but uh, just to highlight the different things that you need to understand in order to be able to successfully predict what's happening in the radiation belts. You not only have to know about high energy particles and wave particle interactions, but you have to know if something is as as um, far off as. Uh, the origin of Whistler, Whistler waves, which means you need a, a lightning model. Most of the Whistler waves are launched by tropospheric lightning. Uh, you need to know about pitch angle diffusion and, and uh, azimuthal drift and energy loss from the radiation belts. Um, okay, precision navigation and timing and uh, communication I'll put together in the interest of time because they, they really the problems come from the same origin. You have, a, have to have propagate a wave through the ionosphere. And uh, this plot shows the problems at low altitudes, at least, of the ionosphere. This, these are plots of uh, radar backscatter above the equator at Hikamarca in Peru. 
uh, altitude here going from 200 kilometers up to about 800 kilometers. And this is time running from sunset to about midnight. As the ionosphere decays, the bottom of the ionosphere decays, it becomes unstable. And uh, instabilities are, uh, if, the, if it becomes unstable, if there becomes a, an instability, will generate plasma bubbles that will uh, rise through the ionosphere, causing scintillation of radio waves as they go up through the ionosphere. And that's what the, these echoes, radar echoes, are echoes from that, the plasma bubbles rising through the ionosphere. Um, the question is, can we predict them? Can we forecast when, when they're going to happen? Uh, uh, a lot of the theories predict that, they, that the seeding of these instabilities is caused by gravity waves, which you'd expect to have to happen in South America above the Andes. Well, this is a plot of the occurrence of uh, these equatorial bubbles on a longitude plot through the year, August through the year to the next August. And you see that the, the um, majority of the, of the sightings of these instabilities occur in this region. South America is here, and this is Africa. And so why Africa? You've got the big continent there, it's, of course, but you don't have the high mountain ranges the, like you do in South America. Um, the, this, again, is plot of density and velocity of the uh, plasma and you see above Africa the, this instability. And it may be that it's the meridional wind that's causing it. If the wind is blowing toward the equator, it'll push the uh, plasma to higher altitude and uh, decrease the conductivity, which is, increases the plasma growth rate. So, uh, but why Africa? And so this is an area of, of current study to try and understand understand this. Um, this is uh, data or a, a model by Alex Mahaloff at Arizona State University that's showing that if you use nested grids, if you, that there are ways to get at the, the uh, development of these plasma instabilities. And he's making headway in, in looking at the relationship now between the dynamics of the background atmosphere and the generation of, of these uh, plasma instabilities. And so in the few minutes I have left, I wanted to talk quickly about uh, uh, RF remote sensing. Uh, this, is, this could be over the horizon radar. It could be uh, radar sensing of satellites, um, radar propagation through, through the ionosphere. And I just wanted to talk quickly about two experiments by Todd Pedersen at uh, AFRL RV. Uh, this one, it's, it was two launches into uh, the equatorial ionosphere of uh, a metal oxide, uh, uh, selenium oxide, which ionizes, and they were looking at the effect of, of, the, um, of a, high, a region of high density ionization, uh, the effect on radar or radio propagation through that region. Uh, this happened last year, and so they're still an an a analyzing the data. A couple of things that were surprising to them, the, the uh, models overestimated the amount of plasma that it would generate. But also, they expected once it was ionized, it would diffuse along the magnetic field line. So if you can, I don't know if you can see here on the side, it actually diffused across the magnetic field lines, mm -hmm. separated into a blue end and a, and a red end. Um, and so they're still scratching their heads about that. I guess they don't understand why it didn't diffuse along the field lines. Before the experiment, the models seemed to suggest that it, to the west of this field, you'd expect a, a descending stable plasma to the west of the cloud. To the east of the cloud, it would become unstable. And these are, uh, this is the model. These are data during, you can see the cloud here, uh, incoherent scatter radar from the Altair uh, radar at Kwajalein. But you see a descending atmosphere here, and it looks unstable here. So it may have borne out this uh, prediction. But again, like I said, it's, it's still being analyzed and still still trying to understand it. And so, and for my last plot or figure, I, the um, same group is looking at ways to modify the ionosphere at high altitudes to look at high altitude processes. This is uh, an artificial ion ionization layer that's generated in Alaska above the HARP uh, incurrence, or the HARP um, heater. It's a, an HF 
heater in Alaska that broadcasts high power, micro, high power HF radiation. Uh, this plot is altitude versus, um, well, plasma frequency, so it can be thought of as plasma density versus altitude. And you see this layer here that's, uh, that's being generated. This is a natural ionosphere background. This layer is being generated by the uh, radiation from below. And the importance of doing that is that you, can, you don't have to wait for nature to give you the right conditions to, to study the ionosphere. If you, you can look at heating rate, cooling rates, uh, um, ion chemistry, uh, plasma processes on demand uh, by uh, treating the ionosphere like a laboratory, really. And so this is, this is some exciting work that's being done there. Well, okay, I'm out of time. And uh, I just wanted to summarize, maybe begin with this plot and, and re, re-emphasize how, um, how connected all of the regions of geospace are. You have uh, processes that occur in isolation, you think, in each of these areas. But in order really to understand any of the, these problems and any of the other, many other problems that affect uh, the Air Force and affect society that are, that are affected by space weather, you really have to understand the uh, geospace as a system and uh, understand how one system affects the other. And I think the uh, portfolio that we have in AFOSR is, is, is well positioned to do that. We're, we're connected with all the major players in it, and I think we're focused in the right area. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, Ken, that's a great presentation. Just a quick question on uh, the HF heating of the ionosphere. Would it be viable to do that to optimize OVHR performance? To optimize why? Over, over the horizon radar performance. So using HF heating of the ionosphere to optimize how your OVHR may uh, Well, um, maybe the pro one of the problems is that, that in order to get the results like this, you have to propagate at a certain angle to the magnetic field. Yeah or over the horizon radar, well, it's, it's really the same process. It's the same frequency. You just have to put more power and, and beam it in the right direction. I guess you could, you could optimize an OTH radar to do the same thing. Okay. It was really a marvelous presentation, and you explained it very well. And I could almost hear Frank Sinatra singing when the solar wind <laughs> <laughs> Something Thank you. careful might think that the sun has something to do with climate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a reason it's not, but it is spectacular, the, uh, what you guys yeah. have done. Well, you know, and this is way off topic, but uh, back uh, several hundred years ago, the, the sun, the solar wind, or the oh, sunspot, yeah, the modern, modern minimum is called, the sunspots went away, like they did the last cycle, and the earth got really cold. <laughs> Correlation is not causation. That's right. <laughs> but we could use it.